welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. This week's episode takes us to the southeast of France near the Mediterranean coast. We are looking at the story of Joseph Vacher, who was nicknamed in the press the Shepherd Killer, or the Jack the Ripper of the Southeast. He's a homeless man who, at the end of the 19th century, killed, raped, and mutilated about 50 people. He's considered to be one of the first identified serial killers of Western Europe, and his case gave rise to profiling. Joseph Vacher, you would have thought he should have been called Joseph Mouton, given yes. the fact he was a shepherd killer. Yes, that would have been nominative determination. Yes. Yes, so he probably had cow farmers in his ancestry somewhere. Didn't you say he was part of a farming family anyway? Yes, he was part of a fa- farming family, yes. Joseph Vaché was born on the 16th of November 1869 in Beaufort, in Isère, southeast of Massif Central. He was one of 16 kids, and his family was a respected family of farmers. He is brought up in an atmosphere of mysticism and superstition created by his mother, Mary Rose, nicknamed Rosalie, 15 years younger than her husband, Pierre. His mum is at the same time very pious and had hallucinations, which I'm guessing were religious hallucinations. You don't think she had any mental health She totally issues. did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if you start having hallucinations, even if it's religious hallucinations, you have something in your head that's not right. You shouldn't see uh, things that don't exist. Yeah, but if you're hallucinating, you're not necessarily choosing the the thing that you're hallucinating no. about. It's too, it's too handy that it's always religious. Well, it's probably just your brain choosing to make things appear that it likes or knows or whatever, I guess. But I don't know, I don't have any, so I can't, I can't really say. His twin brother died at eight months old, smothered under a big bowl of hot bread that one of his brothers to put on top of him. And I didn't find details, but I'm guessing he was sleeping in the bed and somebody put a big bread, you know, the big round bread mm-hmm. that uh, my family eats. And yes. they were like, they're up to three or four kilos. So I didn't want to it would have been most of his weight, if not more. And mm. he just died, suffocated that way. I think that could be possibly the most cliched French way of dying, death by bread. <laughs> yes. There were signs that Vacher wasn't like any other kids very early on. Still quite young, he's considered shifty and cruel by people who know him, Mm -hmm. and he likes to torture animals. Oh, God. All all the the red flags right away. Now, yes. Now people would start thinking, ooh, Mm. that is not right. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. (laughs) That guy is going to kill people at some point. Mm. Yeah, but at the time, people didn't know. At the time, they probably would have thought, oh, he'd be good to have in the abattoir. Yeah, probably, yes. He would have a good career. Mm -hmm. He was also very violent. And he had fits during which he would break everything he could reach as a kid. And if it was people, that was people who got broken. So, so basically uncontrollable rage. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. And he would have no problem hitting people hard. Wow. If they were close enough. And that includes, of course, his brothers, sisters and school friends, whoever was around. Mm. So when he was starting, he better leave. And hope so it would only break. He would only break the the plates and. Stuff. Yeah, always make sure you're out of his diameter of uh, fist length, yeah. presumably. Yeah. Mm. One legend said that he was bitten by a rabbit dog when he was a kid, and he would have been cured by a local healer with a potion <laughs> that would have made him crazy. That's what he says himself. It's not really believable no. anyway. Another legend is that he caught typhoid, which could have left him with some physical and mental scars, according to doctors at the time. Yeah. I don't know if we still think that. I have no idea because typhoid really, who has typhoid now, we get vaccinated. Yeah, that's very true. But I don't think it's that credible. I no. think he was just born that way. So he starts work at 14, which was normal at the time because yep. school was only compulsory until 14 years old. Mm-hmm. That also matches when his mother died. So he needed to go and replace her, I guess, to, okay. to earn money. Although with 16 brothers, uh, yeah, 16 brothers and sisters, that could have been a lot of people working on the farm. But I guess, I mean, do we, do we know she gave birth 16 times, but did all of them make it through to adulthood? 
I know he had 15 brothers and sisters because yeah. it was 16 kids. Yeah, but one of them had died. One of, the di yeah. one of them died. And I don't know how many died that are not listed in the surviving ones. These are the surviving ones that yeah. went, they made it to ad adulthood. Yeah. Well, it, t it tends to be even now if you have a farm that the, the whole family gets involved and uh, helps yeah, run common, things. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because it's a family business, so the, uh, the laws of uh, child work and stuff don't really oh, no. apply. So. No, no. But yeah, remember um, where we lived before, Cindy was driving tractors when she was a kid. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> yeah. So he starts works at 14, and that's probably very soon after that he starts his criminal career. On the 18th of June, 1884, Joseph Amieux, who's 10 years old, is raped and killed in a barn. God. 10 years later, Vashi, who was in the area, is suspected to be the murderer. He's also suspected of four other unsolved criminal crimes at the time. Right. But that's later, and it's only suspicions, just because he happens to be there. Yeah, no hard evidence. No evidence whatsoever, no. I mean, really, if you're talking about almost, what, 150 years ago, then... 1880s, yes. Yeah, you're just... Hard evidence is a bit thin on the ground, I guess. Oh, there would have been nothing. There would have been no DNA, obviously, but there would have no. been even no fingerprints. No, that's were, true. You have to wait for like 20 years or so for, for fingerprints. Yeah, 10, 20 years for fingerprints. Mm. So there was yeah. really absolutely nothing. Mm. Unless there was a witness, then you could get away with anything. Yeah. So then he leaves home. At 16, he enters the Marist Brothers, which is a religious teaching organization. He stays there for two years and finishes his education there. Fairly well educated for a farmer. Yeah. Because he essentially did education up to the equivalent of 16, which is now the minimum age at yeah. school. So, so it would have been fairly well So those well extra years, especially if you've had that kind of gap between education as well. If, if you're a bit older and you go back to uh, learning, it's always, uh, you, you come with extra wisdom. I certainly found when I went back to uh, education and did my degree when I was in my very late 20s. So yeah, so he's probably quite switched on. He even teaches children when he's over there. Okay. So he's like a, a teacher mm -hmm. at the same time. You think for a farmer to go to teaching, that's quite a jump. So yeah, he was obviously yeah. Yeah. clever enough. He's thrown out at 18 though. Oh. For lack of discipline and immorality. Oh. Immol I mean, that's, that's quite a... I can't even say it. Immor... No. <laughs> Being immoral in, in the eyes of the church is, is quite an easy task to do, though. Yes, but he's accused of inappropriate touching of um, other kids oh of his, God, own, okay. his own age, who disciples. He should try the Catholic Church in that case. Well, it was a Catholic organisation, oh, anyway. Oh, okay. Oh, you would have thought he would have fitted yeah. in very well. Yep. So he then goes back to his native village, and he starts working in the fields. Okay. It is at that moment that he would have tried to molest an 11-year-old farmhand. Again, suspicions. Yeah. But he then leaves and goes to Grenoble to live one of, with one of his sisters. That's a big change going from very rural to Grenoble. It's quite a, a big, big city, yeah. Yeah, a big city. Mm -hmm. His sister is called Olympe. They all have funny names. Mm. And she's a prostitute running a brothel. Oh, God. She is nicknamed Kilometer. 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 Okay. Because of her abilities and pavement, sidewalk. Uh-huh. Uh, as a marathonian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so she's hardworking. <laughs> so, yeah. Poor Kil woman. Kilometer. In 1888, he works in a brasserie in Grenoble. Okay. And spends a lot of time with prostitutes, which is... I guess easy for him to meet because well, yes, if your they work with the yeah, sister. You've got, you've got a good way or in. For the sister, even. Yeah. He catches an STD. No, oh, well, that's not really that much Nothing of a surprise. Nothing surprising. Nope. And that leads to a surgical operation in Lyon, and part of one of his testicles is removed. Ooh. It is thought that he was traumatized by that operation. Because well, listen, I'm just listening to it and I've been traumatised by the thought of... I don't even have testicles and having the thought of one of my testicles removed. Ugh, shudder. Yeah, he will mention it later. So mm -hmm. people think that's that one of the triggers. He was yeah. already not right in the head and has already killed a number of people, allegedly. 
but that made it worse. You you wonder if if his it was his was it his mother that was having or his grandmother that was having the um, his mother. It was his mother. Yeah. Clearly, there's been something passed down. There's been yeah. some kind of mm-hmm. mental health issue that's probably been passed down from his mother. Yeah, it's very possible. So then, at eighteen, he has to leave for the army to do his military service, which oh, yeah. was compulsory, and as far as I remember, three years at the time. So he leaves on the 15th of November, 1890, and he joins the 16th Infantry Regiment in Besançon, still in the same area. Okay. There he's subjected to mistreatment by the older soldiers and his superiors. Okay. They're describing as psychologically not right in the head, with dark ideas and a sense of persecution. Okay. But at the same time, he's being persecuted by other people, so it wasn't uh, completely wrong. Yeah, there, there's there's a certain layer of irony there. Yeah, is it persecution when you're persecuted? Yeah. He goes to corporal school, and he's ranked fourth of his class. Of course, he's been educated, so he has a small advantage on mm. a lot of people. That's That's pretty good. So at that point, he has a chance to possibly to stay in the army and then do quite well yeah. for, for himself. Yeah. But the school fails him. Oh, because it is decided that he's not capable of command. So he's, he's even not, though he's, he's fourth in dis- his class, he's not got the discipline. I don't know if it's the discipline, but they decided that he didn't have what it took to command other men. Oh, I see. Okay. So to protest against what he feels is injustice, uh-huh. he tries to cut his own throat. That's a very odd way of protesting. Yes, that's a very terminal way yeah, of protesting. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a one shot deal normally. Yeah, so he obviously lands in the infirmary. Yeah. And once there, his colonel, his superior, um, visits him and decides to evaluate his mental health. Yeah. Even though he's probably not He's trained not or, qualified no. for doing that at all, no. But they decide that he's fine. <laughs> right, okay. So he gets his rank. So he becomes a corporal? Yes, he becomes a corporal. Okay. Yes. Uh, he, in fact, shows a certain ability to command men even though he's considered to be a bit too authoritarian. Okay. And his abilities get him the rank of sergeant very quickly. Okay. During his army stint, he meets in Besançon a young cook called Louise Barron. Eventually, he goes and meets her in baume les dames on the 25th of June, 1893, to ask her hand. Okay. So they must meet for a while, and then he decides, yeah. that's the right woman, I'm going to marry her. She's very surprised and she refuses. It is said that she finds him odd-looking. You'll see on the website okay. what he looked like. He was odd-looking. And his clothes at the time were too short because he had bought nice clothes when he started the army. Oh, and he sprouted. Yeah. They were obviously feeding him better, possibly. And Most then likely, it, yes. Yeah, and, and that made him grow. Yeah, oh. so she finds him funny-looking <laughs> oh, and she dear. laughs at him. Oh, no! That's oh. a low blow. Yes. Let him down gently, love. Yes, and at the time he doesn't know, but she also fell for another soldier. Oh. oh, I almost feel sorry for him. Yeah, so he gets a bit angry. We know that's what he does. Yes, uh-huh. And he shoots her three times <gasps> with his revolver. I guess army revolver. Yeah. He then turns the gun, the gun towards him and shoots himself twice in the head. Right, okay. So that's the end of the story. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You Nobody so. can shoot themselves twice in the head and live, surely. Well, he does. Okay, wow. He's a bad shot then. No, no, no. He got his head. Yeah. But he survives. One of the bullets entered the skull from the right ear, rendering him to completely deaf on that side. Mm. And also that ear uh, then leaks fluid constantly for the rest of his life. And the other bullet came slightly higher. Okay. But also ended up in the skull. So he, ha- he has now two bullets inside his head. Mobile he has no, surgery they yeah. and they have a look and they can't extract them safely. Okay, so they're, so they're obviously not doing any damage where they are, other than giving him a weeping ear. No, his right side of his face is paralyzed. because oh, so he's one, got palsy. One of his nerves, facial mm. nerves, is uh, damaged. And I think one of the bullets was extremely close to the spinal cord, so they don't want to touch it. And the other one is inside the head. They don't want to go there. Oh, good Lord. So so he lives for the rest of his life with two bullets in his head. Oh, my God. That's insane. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I'll tell you what, just as well, he, he, he's not around today because him traveling through airports, that would be a nightmare for him. His head would be going yeah. off all the time. <laughs> yes. 
So on top of being paralyzed on one side of his head, one of his eye, the right eye on the same side, is larger and bloodshot all the time oh, God. than the other. So, I mean, if she was going to say no before all this happened, she definitely would be saying no afterwards, what was the even more off-putting way he looked. But the fact that he shot her three times also doesn't really... Well, no, it doesn't stand him in the best of no. uh, footing for, no. for getting a second attempt at saying, will you marry me? Yeah. Um, I've, I've read accounts of that, and some people say that he tried twice on the same day to propose. So the first time she laughed him away, and he went away. He came back later in the day, tried again, and she laughed at him again. That's when he shot her. No, that never But not works. all the accounts mention these two, yeah. two attempts. But anyway, one or two, it doesn't matter. For the rest of his life, he then wears hats to, to hide his hair, mm. because it looks gross. So at that point, he's not considered responsible psychologically because he has... Um, he has diminished responsibility. Yeah, they, they say he has paranoia and hallucinations. So he spends six months in a mental asylum instead of going to jail okay. or shooting someone. It's in Dol in Jura, so we're talking northern Swiss border. Yeah. Uh, he arrives there on the 7th of June, 1893. Mm-hmm. Cold winters. Oh, yeah, very cold. It's 2,000 meters, so mm. it's quite high. He doesn't really get any care there because that's what mental asylums were at the time. Oh, yeah. And the army discharges him on the 2nd of August, 1893. Mm. And oh, decided, really uh, we don't really want you back. No. <laughs> Deeming him to be a bit mental, I would presume. I would say so, yeah. On the 12th of September, his doctor descri- describes him as paranoid with persecution syndrome. Mm. Vachery escapes the asylum, but he's recaptured soon after in Besançon. He's interned once again, and this time it's at the psychiatric psychiatric hospital Mm. instead of just an asylum. And he's allowed to leave on the 1st of April, 1894, his doctor, Dr. Dufour, considering that he's fully cured. I I tell you what, I would put money on the fact he's not fully cured. Yeah, 19th century... Health, mental health medicine was essentially in non-existent. Yeah. So they, they they caught him in a small moment of lucidity, probably. I would imagine. If that, I, I don't know. I don't really know how that's been judged. I haven't seen the papers. Mm. But anyway, he's let go. Mm. So then he starts his proper murdering career. Okay. The the rest was uh, the, the, that was just precursor. Was it shooting someone? That, that we can consider it training, because he wasn't really at the time found guilty for okay, this any the, of the murders because that, nobody saw so, them. So that, that was just the musical montage of, of murders. Yeah, that was the montage. Yeah. yeah, okay. So he goes back to the village where he used to teach mm-hmm. for the, the religious school. Oh, yes. Then he moved to Grenoble via Beaurepaire. So he goes to Beaurepaire first. Okay. It's there that on the 19th of May, 1894, he commits his first murder, official murder. Okay. The first one he confessed to, anyway. He rapes, uh, rapes and strangles Eugenie Delhomme, who is a 21-year-old factory worker, 200 meters or so from the factory where she, she worked. After that, he commits murders randomly. He roams the country and picks people and kills them, essentially. He doesn't really aim for anything. He just decides, okay, I'm going to kill that one. So if, if he was doing the same thing now he'd probably be considered spree if he if he doesn't have any kind of like type or yes well we'll see that he does have some kind of type okay not in terms of victims but in terms of uh modus operandi i guess okay um he avoids sus- suspicion by moving all the time so mm-hmm. he constantly moves around yeah. the country he's said to walk up to 60 kilometers a day and we'll see later that he commits murders pretty much everywhere from Normandy to the southeast to wow. Bordeaux to the northeast everywhere. So basically all all four points. Of, oh yeah, he just r- roams the country randomly. Yeah. He doesn't aim for anywhere. He just walks and yeah. at some point he said I could kill someone and yeah. he just kills someone. Well, he must be he must have been kind of healthy doing all that walking. Bet he did more than these 10,000 yeah. steps a day. Yes. <laughs> Um, on the 31st of August, 1895, so we're talking a bit a bit more than a year later, the horribly mutilated body of Victor Portalier, who's a 15-year-old shepherd, he disco- discovered his benons in Ain, so again, southeast. He's been disemboweled, Ew. his throat was slit, 
He was raped and his genitals mutilated. Oh, now that's kind of telling. Yes. Now we know, yes. Yeah. At the time, no, didn't no, ring the bell at all. Two, but two together. Yes. I guess for um, for kind of high risk, um, they always say that, you know, um, sex workers are always very vulnerable because they're, they're, they're in a high risk occupation because they're, you know, sometimes in a vulnerable state. Um, I guess shepherds would also kind of like fall into that as well because it's a very isolated job. You're not going to be seeing a lot of people. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And also the fact that he walks randomly in the country. Yeah. You would just find them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because let's face it, he's not going to be walking down the equivalent of, like, the A10. No. No, he's, no. he's going to be going off off piste. Yes. Mm-hmm. Also, he doesn't want to be found, so no. he keeps away from mm-hmm. most people in most cities. Several witnesses describe a homeless man with a scar or a red area around his right eye. Ah, right, okay. Starting to ring a bell. Yeah, and they say he walks with a small bag and a stick, but he's never found. Is Nobody... that like the traditional tramp? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he created the Yeah, he can, the he sees, sees look. the, the, yes, the, yeah. the one who created the look. Yes, he was ahead of the fashion at the yeah. time. So the, the murder goes unsolved because they mm. never find that homeless man. Yeah. At the time, he would obviously have walked away and be hundreds of kilometers mm. away. Yeah. On the 9th of March, 1896... Vache is arrested for vagrancy and mm. GBH. Okay, and he's, he's sentenced... obviously, obviously been going, going berserk again. Yep, and he's sentenced by the tribunal to one month in prison. Just a few days before, a man resembling his description was nearly arrested, but not quite, as he was trying to rape an 11-year-old girl. Good Lord. So there are witnesses around, and he's being seen, but yeah. because he walks around, he's never captured. He's, I mean, but he's very distinctive looking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, he always wears the same clothes. So well, yeah. So if you're, if you have if a small bag, and that's all you have, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. only so much you can keep in your little bag on your stick. Yeah. So an inquiry starts, and there's an instructing judge. Remember, in France, we have instructing judges, yeah. prosecuting judges, and tribunal judges, mm-hmm. three levels. The, the instructing judges work with the police to essentially try to solve a case and then hands in all the evidence to the prosecuting judge who then does his work at the tribunal. So that would be kind of like the equivalent of uh, CPS. Or DA. Or the DA. Yeah. Or even if we were in Scotland, it would be the fiscals, or the procurator yes. fiscals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the judge is called Emile Fourquet and he just started his job in uh, in April 1897, so okay. in the department, which is also department number one, it happens to be. He approaches the case being very familiar with crimes and he decides to base his conclusions in his in, in investigations on similarities he finds between cases. Okay. And in that way, he's thought to be the first French profiler. He decides that on a number of cases, there are some similarities and they might be important. So what he does is he writes to all the judges in the country. Wow. So thousands of judges. Yeah. He describes what he thinks somebody's doing and asks them, have you seen that in your area? Wow. So that's, that's the that, equivalent of a, an a, APB or yeah, that's, I was gonna something s- like that. Uh, it, it, a bolo. It, yeah, that's like you're sending out a bolo. But I mean, that's not even a case of just, you know, blind CCing a large group of judges on an email. I must have, that, logistically, that must have taken a lot of work. Yeah. Mm. Um, it, it's thought that if that judge hadn't been the one looking into one of his cases, he, he would, would never have been caught. Yeah. Because he was travelling too much. It was impossible mm. to find. He would never stay more than a couple of days in any place. So Yeah, he's kind of like the equivalent of these long distance lorry drivers. Yeah, that's what he would be now. Yeah. Yes. Mm. He would be a long distance lorry driver and kill in one day in Lyon, two days later in Bordeaux, yeah. three days later in Paris. Mm-hmm. It would be impossible to find. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. On the fourth of August eighteen ninety seven, Vache is called is caught red handed in molestations, between quotes, that's oh. what newspapers call it. Okay. In a forest in Champy, in Ardèche, so we're closer that's to the Massif Central. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He attacks Madame Plantier, who's a woman farmer. Plantier. Yes, That's Plantier. good nominative determinism again, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. true. But I guess when your family has been farmers for hundreds of years, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. makes sense. But she was obviously on the arable side rather than the, the fleshy side of farming. Yes. Alerted by the screams of the woman 
her husband and two other men rush to the location of the screams uh-huh. and they grab him. He's then arrested. So they grab him, keep him and call yep. the local police force or whatever it is. So he was literally caught in the act. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On the 7th of September, Vashe is sentenced to three months in prison. But three uh, months in prison for... Well, he didn't actually do anything. He tried and then he was attempted caught. Attempted rape only gets yeah. three months. That's, just That's probably pretty good. At the time, I suspect shocking. most people would have got zero. Shocking. Even now, attempted rape, you're not going to go to jail for long. If it can even be pro- proven, that's the thing. Proving attempted. Uh, yeah, consent, we know. Uh-huh. Uh, exactly. So she's condemned to three months in prison. The local instructing judge remembers Fouke's letter and he realizes that some of the details he's heard match okay. what Fouke is describing. The light bulb is switched on. Yes. Mm-hmm. So he notifies Fouke. Mm-hmm. And Fouke, of course, says, oh, yes, sent to me. So he's sent yep. to Fouke. He's transferred to the prison in Bele. I don't remember where Bele is. He tries to escape from the train during the transport because he knows that he's tatties. He's tatties, essentially. yeah. Essentially. If the judge connects the dots, that's it. Because there was no forensics in the 19th century, Murdoch had not invented all the no. finger marks and all that, TV reference, it's very hard to connect the murders without the witness his thinking is there will be witnesses and we've heard that there are people who have seen someone yeah so fitting his description yes so even though there's no chance there's going to be any any evidence he knows that That he's probably been seen yeah and he can be put in the area at that time yeah so he he thinks that that's it so he tries to escape that's enough yeah he fails to escape uh he's then interrogated by the instructing judge Mm. He refuses to talk, obviously. Don't be stupid, don't talk. Yeah, never um, talk to the cops. Yeah. So the judge, who was already fairly clever, noticing the yeah. common thread in a number of murders, mm-hmm. decides to trick him. He's going to make him talk by telling him that he's writing a book about vagrants and he wants his help to describe the vagrant way of life accurately for his book. Okay. It, it is true, he's writing a book about vagrants, but he's writing a book about criminal figuring. <laughs> okay. But he, le- he left he criminal left out, that, out of yeah, the description so that of what he was doing. That one salient piece of information yeah. out. So Vashe doesn't see it. And he just says, oh yeah, I'm going to tell you how I used to live. and So yeah. he starts talking about his life. And, and where he's been, presumably. And where he's been. Yeah. And the judge now connects more dots and more crimes. Okay. Because he's starting to notice that wherever he goes, bodies turn up. Yeah. Bit of a coincidence. Exactly. Mm. And also, when the bodies turn up, they have common characteristics. Okay. So, because he already looked into that and has mm. an idea of what he does to the bodies, yeah. now the number of cases that so are likely to be his... They suddenly start multiplying. ...is starting to go up quite fast. Yeah. According to a psychophysiologic and medical, legal and anatomic study that was done on Vachy uh-huh. by Jean-Vincent Laborde in 1899, so two years later, the modus operandi is as follows. Vache searches and spies on young, isolated people. Mm-hmm. So shepherds uh, are a good target. Yeah. He then finds the condition he's looking for and jumps at their throat. First, he strangles them. Then he quickly cuts the throat okay. with a knife or a razor. He always has one with him. Once the victim's dead, he disembowels them. He removes the breasts if they're women or the testicles if they're men and then randomly, st- randomly stabs wow. the bodies. He really, really did not like having... His testicles operated on. Yeah. Presumably that wasn't done under anaesthetic. Well, no, that didn't exist at the time, so no. So, I mean, operations are scarring enough, fig- figuratively uh, yes. scarring enough as, as they are, so... Yes. But th- what he does with the bodies is why he was called the Jack the Ripper of the Southeast. Okay. The disbarments and ripping out of body parts. Total. Total Ripper. Thing. And at the same, uh, nearly at the same, same time. Same time, yeah. Because Jack the Ripper was, what, time, 1895? Yeah. yeah. So we're talking one to two years later, possibly even started earlier than Jack the Reaper. Yeah, yeah. So Jack the Reaper might be the copycat in this case. And once he's done all that, he rapes the body. Post? Yeah, post-mortem. Yeah, yeah. it's a a corpse at that point. So that's how a doctor describes what he does. That's quite specific. That's not something that... that, that yeah. Most, pe- and that know, happens, most people were kind of like randomly stabbed or something. Yeah, that's and that happens specific. every time. And that's why the judge starting to think something is happening here. Yeah. Because when you see that happening in several cases, oh, yeah, you yeah. start to think, 
that has to be the same person oh yeah or group of people but it, it can't just be randomly that's i mean it's virtually leaving a signature you're yeah you know, it's it, it is so so specific yeah, yeah there's no chance several people no. have developed the same technique in the country at the same time it's just not going to happen so so that's how he knew it was a single person and that's how he knew he was moving around because he got notifications and he could probably read there must have been like reports written and circulated around the country of murders and stuff. He must have seen these happening in several places, and that's why he decided to write to decided to write to all the judges. Yeah, because he saw one here, one there, not too far from him. But then he thought maybe there's more elsewhere, and there were. Mm. So that's how he created profiling. He's suspected of 31 rapes, often post mortem, mm. and murders, most with extreme violence and sadism, like we've we've heard. Yeah. His favorites seem to be teenagers, 13 and 14 year old, roughly. That's the peak of uh, the distribution of his victims. Yeah. I wonder if something happened to him when he was a child that just hasn't been... Well, lots of things happened to him when he was a kid. Uh, like his mother died when he was 14. And on the 10th of October, 1897, he confesses to murders. At first, eight of them. Then on the 16th, he publishes in the Petit Journal... In newspaper at the time, uh-huh. a letter that he negotiated in exchange for his confession. Some people have thought that some of these murders were not his, and you can't think of uh, Henry Lee Lucas, for example, who confessed to 600 oh, yeah, murders. So, yeah, uh-huh. Some people say he can't have committed all these murders. It's just they're dumped on him because he's there. Okay. Nobody likes to think anybody is that evil. Yeah, but yeah. he... During his confession, he gives loads of details. That no one else would have known. Nobody would be likely to know all these details for all these murders. Mm. So they decide that, yes, he actually did commit those murders. There's yeah. just no doubt. So he com- he publishes that letter, which is, at the same time, a confession. Yeah. And also, he blames the country for what happens to him. He says, here we go, you did that. Of and course. Talking to the, co- the whole country. Also, using his confession, confession letter, yeah. they discover bones in a few places. One place is a well, Ooh. so it's not something he could have guessed. No. Because the bones were at the bottom of the well, okay. under a pile of stuff. The Emmy, or the equivalent of the Emmy at the time, who studies the remains, think that it's a, a person of undetermined, undetermined sex. So they don't know if it's male or female, 15 years old or so. Uh-huh. Dead for at least three months. Later, thanks to the clothes, the parents of Claudius Beaupier, mm-hmm. a vagrant who was 14 years old and a train employee, think it's their son. Okay. So the eight murders he confessed to in that first letter yeah. are on the 20th of May, 1894, in Beaurepaire, Isère, where he used to live. Okay. Eugénie Delhomme, we've talked about her, 21 years old. Mm-hmm. She was murdered and raped. So that's before even Jack the Ripper, as far as I can remember. Yeah. On the 20th of November, 1894, in Vidobon, in Var, so we're close to the coast there. Yeah. Louise Marcel, who's 13 years old, a farmer's daughter, is murdered. Mm. On the 12th of May, 1895, in Etol, there's lots of Etols in the country, but this one is in Côte d'Or. Augustine Mortureux, 17 years old, is murdered. On the 24th of August, 1895, it's Saint-Ours in Savoie, so we're going up the mountains on yeah, the, in yeah. the east. The widow Morand, 58 years old, is murdered and raped, then raped. On the 31st of August, 1895, in Benonce, hein, Victor Portalier, we've talked about him, 15 years old, shepherd, is murdered and raped, then raped. On the 22nd of September, 1895, in saint étienne de boulogne in Ardèche, so on the other side of the Rhône Valley, Pierre Massopel, uh-huh. from Pelé, 14 years old, shepherd, is murdered, then raped. Shepherds are clearly easy targets for him. Yes, that's why he's called the shepherd killer. Yeah. On the 1st of March, 1896, in noyen sur sarthe so going up into the north, Marie de Rouet, 11 years old, he attempts to rape. And that's one of the, wi- the cases where there's witnesses they talk about somebody with a hat and a, mm. a red scar on the right side of his face. So he's, he's, he's obviously more comfortable with necrophilia rather than actual... Yeah, I guess so, yes. Performing on a, on a live body. Yes. On the 10th of September 1896 in Busset, in Allier, so still in the west of the valley, 
Marie Moussier Loru, 19 years old, is murdered on the 1st of October 1896 in Varennes Saint Honora, Saint in Haute Loire. So we're going north quite far at that point. Rosine Rodier, 14 years old, Shepherd, is murdered. At the end of May 1897, there's no date for that one, Tassin Ladmilune in the Rhone department. Mm -hmm. Claudius Beaupier, we talked about him, 14 years old, vagrant, is murdered, then thrown down in the well. Mm. And on the 18th of June 1897, in Cours de la in Rhone again, Jean-Pierre Laurent, 14 years old, farmhand, is murdered, then raped. So he confesses to all his murders and gives loads of details about those. Yeah, I mean, that's a short spell of time as well. He must have been, as you say, you know, moving so much every day. Yes, he does a few a year. Yeah. Yes, so it's really one or two a year. And sometimes there's a good distance between them. Mm. But that's the ones he confesses to, it's eight. But he's thought to have killed about 50. Wow. He doesn't confess to the others yet. I don't think if he, don't remember if he actually did to con confess to all the others. At that point, it seems redundant if you're going to be... Exactly. So the judge goes to trial at that point because yeah, cause there's eight enough. is enough. Yes, <laughs> well... Don't need more than eight. You would do, well, families may possibly, you know, would like justice for... Yes, for the remaining true. ones. But they don't really know what happened to them anyway. So no. um, at the time, a shepherd, a, like a teenage shepherd dying in the middle of a field. Not that probably unusual. not that uncommon. So. No. Quite a high risk job, really, for exposure and. Uh, yeah. In, in, or in the summer, of dying of uh, heat stroke or something. Yeah. So the trial starts on the 26th of October 1898 in Bourg en Bresse. As with many big cases at the time, the local, national, and even international newspapers become obsessed with the case. Of so course. There's again, it's salacious. like in the previous, yeah, previous case, hundreds of articles. It lasts for three full days. Justice was quite fast at the time. Yeah. During the trial, he has a sign around his neck that says, I have two bullets in my head. Yeah, but you put them there. Yeah, and he shouts things like, Vive Jésus, Vive Jeanne d'Arc. Oh, comparing himself to Joan of Arc. Well, you know, he celebrates her. Uh, I guess it's, I don't know, he wants to look crazy. Nobody really knows if he's actually saying something he believes or just trying to look crazy. Yeah. But it kind of works. He does look crazy. He also has, it's in the photos on the website, because there's really only one photo of him. It's a photo the instructing judge took to circulate around the country once he was arrested mm -hmm. to show witnesses, to ask, is Do it the you person you saw? Yeah. He has a white hat on his head. Uh -huh. And most people think that's his normal hat, but it's not. Okay. It's a hat he had made before the trial. And some people think it's to reflect the white hermine of the judge's dresses. So he wanted a hat with the same, right. same fabric, essentially. But when he was murdering, he had the Panama hat on his head. Okay. So basically he wants to be twinsies with the judge. Yeah, I don't really know why he did that. That's strange. The, the, the white of the judge's dresses is supposed to be purity and impartiality. Mm. Maybe he wanted to also reflect purity after having confessed to nearly a dozen murders. I don't know. It but doesn't work like that. It's not a confessional. I know. But most people think that that's his normal hat and that's what he normally looked like, but yeah. it's not the case. It's he's just the only photo we know of. Yeah, but he's going to need more than just a few Hail Marys to uh, get oh, yeah. out of this one. Yes. During the trial, a lot of discussions are about whether his mental health justifies trial. Mm. In the Napoleonic Penal Code of 18, 1810, which is what he's judged on, okay. because it's still valid at the time. It's still valid today, but it's been changed a lot. But at the time, really? it was very... Yeah, Napoleonic Code is what most of Europe works on. Okay. He described how the law should work, and it's still... Still the case. But it's still obviously the same not rules. the hard parameters of, of how you judge someone to be Articles have been changed a lot over time okay. in the last hundred and fifty years. But or the so. general structure is still But the general structure okay. is still there. You can Fair enough. you can still look up Article sixty four, for example, which is about mental health and a lot of it is still there. It's been mm -hmm. changed a lot, but the yeah. structure is still there. So anyway, he's judged on that at the time, especially Article sixty four. Okay. Which specifies that there can't be crime when the accused is in a state of delirium or under a force he can't resist. Right, okay, so it's more the latter. Well, the instructing judge tasks three doctors to judge his mental health. Okay. And he wants to know whether he was aware of his actions. 
two more doctors are tasked to take x-rays of his head and double check that the bullets are actually there. Right. They are. Of course they are. There is an existing medical record from the 19th of September 1897 when he was interned. It's written by a doctor, Bozoni, in a Bailey prison. Okay. It states that Vashi has mental issues, ideas close to persecution, disdain for regular life, and he has otitis, and his face is partially paralyzed following gunshot. He also, it also states that there are two bullets in his head, and Vashi's responsibility is very much diminished. So that's an existing report, but they don't want to use that report. They want to have a new one. So that's what the three doctors are tasked to write. Right. During his stay in prison awaiting trial, he sends a lot of letters. He writes to many, many, many people. He even writes to the judge to ask for more paper, more pens, and a more comfortable chair so he can write. Oh, I see. He writes another letter in a newspaper where, again, he blames... France in general, i.e. the population, for what happened to him. Because it's not him, it's other people who did that. It's a whole bunch of nonsense. Yeah. But the newspapers publish it because well, it sells newspapers, I well, guess, yeah. even yeah. if it's complete cool. nonsense. On the 28th of October, 1898, after a quarter of an hour of deliberation, Vashi is found guilty. <laughs> oh, 15 minutes. Yeah. But they only try him for the murder of Victor Portelier. Uh, the 14-year-old... At the uh, bottom vagrant. of the well. Yes. They decided that there's no point trying him for all the murders, known or unknown. They right. decided to concentrate on one, which they still do now. Okay. If they are sure of a conviction, they will go after that one and not bother with the others. So okay. that's what they do because they have more evidence for that one. He requests pardon from the president who was at the time Felix Faure. Uh, Felix Faure wasn't against the death penalty, so it's rejected, not unlike other, ju- uh, the other presidents okay. that we've heard of before. On the last day of the year 1898, he's guillotined on the Champ de Mars in Bourg-en-Bresse by Louis Dibler or Dibley. We've heard of him before in several cases. The famous head chopper. The famous head chopper. It is, in fact, the last execution he carries out. He quit his job on the 2nd of January. Did he quit or did he retire? He probably retired. He probably had enough. That's I, going, it's quite a soul-destroying job. I would say so, yes. So, But I haven't found any more information than that. According to newspaper newspapers, Vash's last words were, it's a good thing I had my hair cut. <laughs> Those are good last words for he a guillotine. <laughs> yeah, he had asked to have his, his hair and beard shaved not long before his execution. Okay. Um, he also said something on the way of... Here it is for the asylums. So essentially he's blaming asylums for mm. responsibility. He seems to be blaming everyone else except himself. Yeah. You think that killing me, France, atones for your crimes? Yeah. France is guilty. Everything is injustice. Of course. That seems to have been the of last course. words. Over 2,000 people watched the execution, despite the cold and the rain. That's what you want to do with your... Uh, you've brought the bells in the night before. You've been yeah. giving it loudly. Tell you what's great for the next day. Let's go much a psychopath's head being chopped off. Yeah. So there is an autopsy done on his body. Um, it's performed the three hours after his execution. Apart from the bullet wounds, nothing of significance is found on his body. No. One note on the, the autopsy is that he had flat feet and extremely developed calves. Well, yeah, he would do. Feel the burn! Exactly. His brain is studied several times over time as mm. well. They really try to find a, an explanation for, for his actions. And apart from uh, an amyloid bodies in large numbers, okay, which would have called senile degenerations in old age. Of course, he never got he never to old age. He died at 29, so he never yeah. got there. But he would have probably have early senility, senility in, yeah. in his life. Nothing is found, no. so they can't explain it. And that's it. That's the story of Joseph Vashi. And I think the moral of the story definitely goes, doesn't matter how you want to keep the body beautiful, if your mind's rotten, you're rotten. 